Can I have anyone and everyone who's ever seen a doctor, or for that matter, any healthcare professional, please raise your hand right now. A little laughter. You can put your hands down. Obviously, it's all of you. Because at the end of the day, healthcare affects all of us. The American healthcare system is our system, and we've all been part of it from the time you're born to the time you die. For some, you access it when you're healthy, got a cold, have a physical. For others, it's a difference between life and death. But what if I told you the entire American healthcare system is wrong and we're doing it all backwards? Now, I'm not here to talk about politics and healthcare reform. I think as a country, we've had enough of that. <laughs> I want to share with you what I've learned as the president and CEO of a healthcare organization, as a doctor, and as a patient. And I hope you leave here inspired and motivated to not only help me change the American healthcare system, but the health of America. So let's start with my story. It starts in 1971, where my mom and my dad, hi mom and dad, <laughs> emigrated from India to America. My dad had gone to school here earlier at Kansas State University, went back to India, met my mother, married her a chemist, and convinced her with all of his charm to leave everything she ever knew, she'd never left the country, and to move to America. And they chose the land of opportunity, Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> they eventually made their way to Ann Arbor. <laughs> and if you think about it, it's kind of a cute story because my parents have never moved back, so technically my mom and my dad are still on their honeymoon. <laughs> so fast forward to 1972, it's a cold May day, and I'm born. I miss that hair. I miss hair. <laughs> and I had a great year. First year of my life, amazing, from what I'm told. But at age 13 months, my mom and my dad got the news that no parent ever wants. Your baby has cancer. I had a rare tumor in my right eye called retinoblastoma. And it's 1973 in the United States of America, we have a pretty good healthcare system. And the doctors took me to the operating room and they removed the tumor by removing my eye. So this is a prosthetic. Now when I look back in the motivation that created, I also think about the fact that if my dad had not been able to convince my mother to move here, I would have been born in India. Now, although the Indian healthcare system today is amazing, back in 1973, not so much. And likely, if I was born in India in 1972 and had cancer in 1973, I would have lost more than just my eye. That single event has molded my entire life. Children grow up. They want to be a teacher, then they switch their mind to be a police officer, then a fireman, then a lawyer, then maybe a doctor, play in the NBA, go to the NFL. I only ever wanted one thing for my life. All I ever wanted to be was a doctor. I wanted to take care of sick people like the doctors who took care of me when I was sick. Dedicated my whole life to it. By the time I hit high school, I announced to my mother and father that I would like to apply to medical school while I'm still in high school. There were a few programs in the country that allowed for that. There were combined undergraduate and graduate programs. My parents supported me on this quest, and at age 17, by myself, pre-cell phone, they put me on planes to Miami, to Boston, to Kansas City. I finally chose Wisconsin to go to school. And seven years later, you could call me doctor. So I had to choose a specialty at that point as I graduated medical school. And once again, I wanted to help sick people. But I didn't know what age group. 
So I actually wound up doing a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics. And I'm boarded in both. Fast forward to finishing my training, and then I had to find a job, the reality of the world. And I chose to be a hospitalist. And I get asked a lot, what is a hospital? What's a hospitalist? It's a doctor who works in the hospital. <laughs> I still get the question all the time. But what do you do, I get asked. I said, well, I take care of sick people. I'm the kind of doctor you never want to see, because if I'm standing over your bed, it's probably not a good day for you. It means you're sick. You know, at the end of the day, I took a lot of pride in this. If you had high blood pressure and had a stroke, I got called down to the emergency department to bring you into the hospital and take care of you. If you smoke two packs a day and you have emphysema and you can't breathe anymore, I put a tube down your throat and help you breathe and hook you up to a ventilator. I could save your life. You can imagine the adrenaline rush of a practice like that. And I still love it. still love taking care of sick people. But over the years, a little voice in my head got louder and louder. You see, every time I took a knee in the ICU to break bad news to a family, or stood over a patient or sat on their bed and talked to them about a bad diagnosis, I knew in my heart that if I had seen that patient two days prior, two weeks prior, two months prior, or two years prior, that 80 to 90% of what I saw in the hospital was preventable. And that little voice got louder and louder and louder. And I realized I needed to do something else with my education on top of taking care of sick people. So I became the medical director of the quality at our hospital. So I got great exposure in learning all the things we need to do right in medicine when taking care of sick people. So I needed more. So at the age of 36, my healthcare organization made me the president and CEO to help lead us through change. And by age 46, this year, I serve as the chairman of the board of the American Medical Group Association, a trade association representing the largest groups in the country around organized healthcare. I even got to testify to Congress this summer. At the end of the day, all of these experiences put together have helped craft what I feel we need to do to change the American healthcare system and the health of America. Now, it's not going to be easy. And in all honesty, it has nothing to do with just physicians, nurses, hospitals, clinics. That's just one component of the American healthcare ecosystem. We all raised our hands. We're all part of the American healthcare system, so we all have a role to play and changing it. So let's start with the first area of change, the financing system of healthcare in America. It's 100%, most of it, based on what's called a fee-for-service system. What does that mean? We get a fee when we give, provide you a service, like getting your oil changed. You pay the person to change your oil. You pay the person to mow your lawn. But this is healthcare. So what's that service? It's us taking care of you when you're sick. So now you're thinking, all right, this is not good. 100% of our financial motivation, the engine that runs our industry, is based on you getting sick. We make more money when bad things happen to good people. It's kind of a perverse system. So we need to move to what's called a value-based system, where physicians, hospitals, healthcare providers are motivated and paid to take care of people to keep them healthy. We still need to take care of sick people. We do a great job of it in this country, but we have no financial focus, no motivation to keep people healthy. That's what's called a value-based healthcare system. And that's what we need to move to. We still need to reimburse people to take care of people when they're sick, but half or maybe even more of our attention should be to keep people healthy. So when I talk about value-based healthcare systems around the country, I always get the question, well, what about personal responsibility? What is our responsibility? So let's talk about that. 
talk about two categories of personal responsibility. The first being food. Not everybody's favorite topic, but let's be honest, we live in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> Every day, we consume products that have zero nutritional value that could lead to our death, and we feed them to our children. That's a pretty strong statement, but we feed ourselves things that could kill us. And how are we going to change that? Well, we've been faced before in this country with that. Doctors used to give out cigarettes in clinics, even in the hospital, believe it or not. We could quickly figure it out, not good. We'll kill you. In the 1980s, the Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop, convinced Congress to put a label on every pack of cigarettes, smoke one of these, it could kill you. Now, am I saying that in every can of soda that we should put a label, drink this, you could become obese and it could kill you? Kind of. Maybe we need extreme education in this country because obviously a label with a percentage of A's and B's and D's isn't working on the back of a box or the back of a can. We need to do something different. And we also need to give access to healthy food. There's actually a medical group in Ohio that has a healthy grocery store. Now that's changing for the better. So when it comes to personal responsibility, food has a big deal. How about another category? Movement, exercise. In this country, when we're kids, we play, and then our sole source of exercise is competition. It's sports. And what happens when you don't go to the next level in sports? You stop exercising, you stop moving. We need to take the focus away from competition when it comes to movement and exercise in this country. We need to develop habits in our children around exercise and our families around exercise. That has nothing to do with sports. Still want everybody to play sports. I mean, we are in title town here. But at the end of the day, it can't be the way we teach about health. We need to keep moving as a society. Now, is this easy change? No. Changing how people make their money? That goes over really well. <laughs> Taking away something off of somebody's plate? Even better. Telling a kid to put down their iPad and move? That's fun. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we have to be part of the change. So here's three things you can do today when you go home. If you buy health insurance for yourself or for a company, ask that health insurance company, do you pay your providers based on fee-for-service or a value-based contract? They're going to give you a strange look. They're going to be shocked that you know about that. But we need to start having those conversations. You are consumers of healthcare. You need to purchase the right kind of insurance, one that motivates people to keep you healthy, not profit off your sickness. Go home today. Look in your refrigerator, your freezer, your pantry. We all have something that has zero nutritional value that we buy on a regular basis. Get rid of it. One thing, and replace it with something healthy. Think about that. One thing you're going to eliminate from your family and replace it with something good for your family and repeat that every three to four months. That's change that we could all do. And if you have a family and you have children or you're going to have children, get moving. Run, bike, do something. Do it as a family. Don't make exercise and the habit of exercise about just playing sports. Make it the fabric of your family. Make it a habit that your children will have forever and think about it and teach about it as healthy. Healthcare affects all of us. We all raised our hands. But at the end of the day, it's up to all of us to make it better. Because we're talking about improving the health of America and our lives depend on it. Thank you.